Hello, welcome to a new video on an attempted proof of the Riemann hypothesis. I'm your host, Trader Sada, and hopefully you're doing very, very well. First things first, thank you for watching, I really do appreciate it. And now on to the video. In this series, I try to use the exponential Lambert series to better understand the Riemann hypothesis. So first, let me explain uh, in some simplistic detail what the exponential Lambert series is. Okay, so the classical Lambert series uh, is as such. Imagine you had some b sub m uh, x to the m. This is what we call ordinary generating function. Uh, it also has uh, this other uh, representation, 1 minus x to the n. Okay, so uh, b sub m is arithmetic function, a sub n, arithmetic function, and they are connected by what? The Mobius inversion formula. So if you have a sub n, Dirichlet convolution around 1, you have m, you get b sub m. Now, for the purposes of this video, we're not going to go into Dirichlet convolutions because many of the pairs of uh, b sub n and a sub n are already known, right? We actually don't have to do much work there at all. We're not, like, creating a whole bunch of new Mobius inversion pairs, okay? So what we'd like to do is say, hey, we have the OGF. What about the EGF? What about the exponential generating function? This one you have uh, the divided by m factorial. Uh, well, this becomes, when you do the transformation, uh, it becomes e n x to the n uh, minus 1. Okay, this is Mittag Leffler function. Now, it's very, uh, you know, uh, interesting way to do this. Like, there's multiple ways to get the EGF. Borel summation, you can use inverse Laplace transform. I will just say EGF, right? So, OGF, ordinary generating functions, EGF. In this case, what we are using is, uh, well, I'll use f hat equals, uh, this is inverse Laplace transform, right? One divided by z, uh, f, one divided by z, you can't see that very well, one divided by z, and then this goes to our x one, okay? And that's, uh, you know, that's sufficient for what we're doing, okay? Now notice, uh, this is just with x and yeah, this is like regular generating functions. Uh, what if I do this, right? E two pi i tau, okay? And all of a sudden, right? E two pi i uh, tau. I make it kind of like Fourier, right? Okay. So you have some very two pi i tau uh, tau n. You have some very very nice uh, beautiful uh, stuff here, right? So this right here. If you take a uh, course in modular forms, modular functions, uh, you know this looks more or less like uh, some type of modular form. You know, there's a for, for modular forms, one of the conditions is that you have to have what? Uh, for your expansion, okay? This is where the insight comes in, right? That maybe this has to do with, uh, you know, modular forms, theta functions, something like that, right? And, uh, this is a Fourier expansion, and this is the other uh, representation that you get for free. Okay. So what we'd like to do is say, hey, uh, let's start building uh, some identities off of this, right? Maybe there's a functional equation uh, that is related to theta functions or Eisenstein series or modular forms or something like that, right? Let's get our hands a little bit dirty. Okay, so our idea is that we'd like to show that it obeys... Uh, this functional equation for a certain uh, t tilde. Okay, so first uh, one right here, one is that look, it has to be periodic. Okay, so this is pretty obvious, right? Like this is, you know, it's four year has four year expansion. We're okay. Second one, uh, a little bit more complicated to prove, uh, and it seems to be only true under certain conditions, right? Um, for certain a sub n and uh, b sub n. Okay. So this right here, this, this part, uh, is proved uh, via this contour integral, okay? Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this person's name, Her Hermites, Hermites method, something like that. Uh, it is in the book, uh, Richard Bellman, uh, by Richard Bellman, A Brief Introduction to Theta Functions. You can find it there. Uh, that's where I experienced it first. And uh, look, you take the contour integral of f of tau, e to the negative uh, 2m i tau, d tau. And if in the contour it all equals zero, um, 
you know, you're good, right? It's going to obey this. Now, let's give a deeper insight. Let's just not just call it a contour. Let's really explain this, right? Uh, in Fourier world, right, you have, what, periodic functions, okay? So maybe there's some periodicity in the real dimension, right? And then now we can have periodicity in the complex dimension as well, right? Say, for example, the function was periodic in the complex dimension. This gives a parallelogram, right? You have some snapshot, some screenshot, so to speak, uh, in the complex plane where your, your, your function is, in, is entire in that, right? So what we'd like to do is we'd like to uh, integrate in this parallelogram and show that when we add up everything in this uh, periodic you know, par parallelogram, that equals zero. That's where the contour idea comes in. Go from pi divided by two, pi divided by two, Here's the minus, uh, you know, i k. You know, this is the this is the parallelogram, right? See, so negative pi divided by two. This is uh, this is repeated integration. So really, this should be in here, of course. Uh, but it's a lot to write out that way. So very very nice. Okay, so if we can, uh, you know, do our, you know, contour integration on uh, our ELS with you know the e to the two pi i we can show that it obeys uh, this functional equation. Now, if it does obey this functional equation, uh, f of tau has this representation, right? Uh, which is very, very closely related to the theta functions. Right, so proof, uh, proof of this. So f of tau equal to a representation with the mid tau left way function in there, right? And what we can do is we can uh, blow apart the mid tau left layer function into its sum series representation. Sub n equals 1 to infinity, uh, sub d equals 1 to infinity, a sub n divided by gamma nd plus 1 e to the 2 pi i tau nd. Beautiful, right? And this is like really, really easy to, to deal with, right? Like this is really easy to integrate. In fact, the contour here is just going to come in here. This is going to stay the same and we're going to deal with this nonsense right here. Okay. So this is the a sub n representation. That's how we'll refer to it as. This is the a sub n representation. This is the b sub m representation. Okay. Now uh, I should say for the duration of this video, uh, q is set equal to e to the two i tau. All right. So you, know, you see the q there. I won't get in trouble too much. Uh, q equals e to the two i tau. Okay. Now uh, let's perform our you know integration. This is a thing of computers, not mortals. So we plug this in to a computational machine, and uh, these are the solutions that we get. Okay, so t tilde, right here, the parallelogram, the, the boundary of the parallelogram, are right here. Okay, so these are all the a sub n representations. Of course, there are b sub m representations. We'll see them on the other side. Uh, but the cool thing is, is that the a sub n, a sub n, a sub n survives. Okay. And not only does it survive, uh, but we have, you know, beautiful, beautiful periodicity, right? In fact, these are kind of, well, in, in theory, a sub n could kind of be anything, but they're arbitrary, right? You could more or less do a whole bunch of cool things with it. Now, uh, a sub n could even be uh, something like n negative s or uh, in general, n to the s, right? So really what we have is a general solution. Okay, a general solution. You know, t tilde, a sub n is kind of free variable, t tilde is very, very cool. Now, one thing I should mention, in the book, they have k, of course, here I'm modern, I use t tilde. Okay, so same thing, you know, uh, t tilde is right here, right? Now, you might say, well, you've not explained b, right? What is going to be b? Uh, when we set b equal to, uh, you know, um, uh, q to the negative one, it's actually going to be the third theta function. And doing so is going to give us really, really, really deep insights into the ring hypothesis. Let me flip the board and we're gonna jump right into it. All right, so for q, as I said, equals e to the uh, two pi i tau, and b equals uh, q to the minus one, we need to find some a sub n and b sub m uh, and t tilde, by definition, such that uh, this functional equation holds, okay? 
Because if this functional equation holds, what do we have? We have theta 3 of uh, you know, tau. And to jump really quick ahead, obviously you can see when we Mellon transform this with an I plugged in, we get functional equation of Riemann zeta function. Okay? And that's going to be really, really useful down the line. Okay? So first, uh, you know, uh, let me explain uh, this scenario right here and how we got here. So over here, we want to find t tilde such that, um, you know, this functional equation is obeyed. So what we're going to use is the b sub m version, the Fourier coefficients. And we're going to go straight through. We're going to just plug in for f of tau, exponential lambda series, right? And for b, we're going to plug in uh, e, negative, e to the negative 2i tau, okay? And when we do all this, you know, uh, basic uh, algebra, we get a solution. 1 equals e to the 2 pi squared i uh, t tilde equals uh, e to the negative 4i tau, okay? And the solution to this is actually quite beautiful, right? Uh, it's something that you would actually expect, right? It's t tilde equals i k where k is in the integers, divided by uh, pi, okay? That's very, very beautiful for many of reasons, uh, mainly because this pi, this, you know, i divided by pi, uh, is really, um, you know, emblematic of uh, deep complex analysis, okay? So let's, uh, let's do this, right? So we have uh, k, obviously k is uh, in the integers, but we can put plus or minus here, this is explicit, and it equals, m equals 1 to infinity. Now this is the b sub m representation, right? This is the a sub n representation that we sh uh, showed on the other side, but you can do this on, on this as well. And I've just factored out the m and everything like that. It is a Fourier coefficient. So notice that this i pi divided by uh, pi minus 1, it factors out, okay? It factors out. And we just get this right here. And we get this right here. So we have what? Pi minus 1 times our integer divided by pi squared, okay? And uh, we're going to set equal to, to this right here. Now, what we're going to do is set uh, b sub m equals m to the uh, kappa one, all right? And uh, this Mobius inversion pair gives this. This is jordan totian function. Uh, I don't have time in this video to explain the jordan totian function, but it is the general totian function. And a lot of people are Euler's totian function um, this is an uh, arithmetic function, okay? And it's actually, uh, I would say in this video, not strictly rigorously necessary um, because we're just going to be using the Fourier uh, expanse, not the, uh, not the A sub N representation. Okay, so for K greater than or equal to five, there's actually a whole bunch of constants uh, that uh, K1 could be, right? Now, if you look at this function right here, it is an element between 1 and infinity, right? Uh, obviously, it starts at m equals 1, so no matter what it starts at, right, you always have 1. It's addition. It's going to go on uh, forever and ever and ever. It's going to be monotonically increasing out of the series. So this right here uh, is between 1 and infinity. Now, when you do just this constant, I think it's like 0 0.22 something, uh, in order to make this above 1, it has to be k, uh, greater than or equal to 5. So if you get this for free, k is going to be, you know, we can solve all these constants. In fact, the whole proof rests on that, that just ca these constants exist. Uh, because kappa 1 is a free variable, it could be any number, uh, there's a mapping. Now, you know, maybe there's a number theorist out there who's much more brilliant than me, who can solve for the, the constant itself, and get the actual numerical value, and that's a whole thing later on, but for our purposes, we just, you know, it's good enough that this constant exists, right? We don't really need to actually find it, which is really interesting. So, uh, for these kappa constants, right, we have, what, exponential Lambert series, uh, valued e to the 2, I, 2 pi i tau, and you have jordan totian function with, these, with this constant, m to the uh, kappa constant equals what? This right here, theta 3 uh, tau. Now the third theta function is exotic and beautiful because when you take the Mellon transform and you evaluate the s divided by 2, you get functional equation of the Riemann zeta function. 
So, uh, this is where the beauty comes in. We found a whole new representation for theta of three, and what we can do is we can get these uh, two representations equal to each other, right? Now notice uh, very subtle differences, uh, two pi, negative s divided by two, so you still have your gamma of s divided by two, uh, but now you have this series, right? So there's this constant, this kappa one for the series right here. Okay, very, very nice. So what we're going to do is we're going to set them equal to each other. Obviously the gamma of s divided by two cancels out and we get new representation for Riemann zeta function. Z to s equals 2 to the negative s divided by 2. You have all of this for s greater than 1. Now, in a traditional number theory, we have eta function. And all that is is that you have the regular Riemann z function multiplied by 1 minus 2 to the 1 minus s. I'm not sure if that's really explicit. Okay, 1 minus s. And this is valid for the critical strip. Okay, this is really valid for the critical strip. So what we have to do for the critical strip is just plug in uh, eta one half plus bi. Now let's talk about the Riemann hypothesis uh, in general, right? The Riemann hypothesis uh, really states that for the Riemann zeta function, right, of one half plus bi equals zero, all the zeros, right, are on this one half plus bi line, okay? That, in other words, uh, B here is always uh, real, right? There uh, really exist uh, no zero solutions where uh, there's just, you know, a real whatever part. Okay. So one of the ways that we can go about uh, showing this is that if uh, B was replaced with beta I, um, the question is, uh, look, would there be a zero, right? So imagine here, if I plugged in like two i, okay? And obviously the i's, and this is square them together, whatever, you get, you get one half, uh, what? Minus two or something, right? And if that equals zero, okay, the Riemann hypothesis is false. We can generalize this, beta, right? Uh, beta i, and all we have to do is show that this uh, never satisfies, okay? Very, very easy to do uh, with this new representation. All we have to do, eta, since it's valid for a critical strip, one half plus bi, we plug in everything, uh, some simple algebra there. Now notice a few things. Uh, look, this could never be zero, this could never be zero. The only thing that could ever really uh, be zero is this one minus uh, two to the one half uh, minus uh, bi, okay? This is uh, you know where all the fun happens. Uh, so the, if this is the only term that could possibly be zero. We set it equal to zero. We find beta, okay? Uh, so for beta i, right? We plug in the beta i here. Uh, beta, uh, the only possible scenario is that beta is going to equal one half, okay? So this is the only value that we have to check. And clearly, uh, <laughs> it doesn't work that way, right? If, if beta equals one half, we can plug this in to our functional equation of the Riemann zeta function. Uh, and when we have, uh, what? Zeta of zero, this equals negative one half, okay? No zero, okay? So this is a conclusion, right? There are, uh, you know, no uh, zeros, no uh, off the uh, critical strip, okay? It, it's just not possible with the eta function. Now I should say the eta function and this, uh, this functional equation, the Riemann zeta function, they have the same poles, right? So to prove this is to prove the Riemann zeta function, and uh, that looks like uh, that looks like QED. I mean, one of the things that I've been doing is looking over this idea multiple multiple times and trying to find you know some misstep or something like that. But uh, I think it looks pretty good. I mean. I would be really interested to see what you all have to say in the comments. Maybe you can find a hole, maybe punch uh, some holes in my logic. But I think um, this at least approach uh, is worth uh, investigating. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. Uh, like, share, subscribe, comment, and I will see you next iteration.